Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining us for the community meeting tonight on supervised consumption sites. I'm Carl Shortino. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Executive Vice President of External Relations at Fenway Health. It's my pleasure to be your host for tonight. Before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping items. First, we do have Spanish and ASL interpreter services here this evening. Let me introduce Lucilia and Jeb, and Jeb will be giving a brief explanation on how to access Spanish interpretation. Jeb, all yours. Maybe. Or Lucilia, I can hear you. If you can do you the- You can hear me? Sure. Yeah. So eh, I'll say it in Spanish first. Este, vamos a utilizar el, el de intérprete y tienen que escoger uno de los dos idiomas. Si deciden, van a ver el globo de, de interpretación, interpretation, van a ver ese globo y cuando vean ese globo es importante que escojan o inglés es, o español. There is an interpretation globe on the bottom of your screen and you need to choose one of the language when prompted. If you want to hear it in Spanish, you can choose Spanish. Si quieren escucharlo en español, van a escoger el de español. Y si no, pues en inglés. Es importante que escojan uno. It's really important to choose one of those when you're prompted, to choose one of the languages in the interpretation. And you're going to see the globe where it says interpretation. Thank you, Lucilia, and also Jeb, and also to our ASL interpreters, Michael and Carrie, who are supporting us here this evening. Um, I also want to let the audience know that we are recording the meeting this evening. So if you have to leave early or if you know folks that wanted to join but weren't able to be here tonight, it will be posted online for sharing afterwards. Um, so as we go through the program, if you have a question, you can submit it via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I do want to note that all questions are welcome, and I want to invite you and remind you that it's important to consider the words that we use and the language that we use to avoid stigmatizing language. If you're not sure about how to word something, that's okay. I su suggest using first person framing. For example, instead of saying a drug user, try saying something like people who use drugs, centering the people to start with. We want to center the people impacted by this discussion with respect and dignity in their humanity of everyone. Before we begin, I have two acknowledgements I want to make. The first is a land acknowledgement. If you're not familiar with this practice, it's a way of lifting up and honoring those native peoples who for generations stewarded the land that we live on and continue to live in our communities. So tonight for Somerville, Somerville sits on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Pawtucket, Namkeeg, and Massachusetts people. So we wanna honor the, those communities here tonight. I also want to acknowledge the impact of the war on drugs on Black, Indigenous, and people of color. These policies have exacerbated the legacy of racism by disproportionately arresting, jailing, and dismantling BIPOC communities for generations. And when it comes to the opioid crisis, that impact continues to be felt with increases in overdose deaths by people of color today. It's important when we have these discussions around supervised consumption sites to acknowledge the high cost that communities of color have paid and continue to pay as we try to advance policies that will actually save lives and actually improve our communities. So with that, let's dive in. So as I mentioned, I'm here from Fenway Health, which is an organization that has a history and mission of serving LGBTQIA plus communities and other underserved communities. This includes people who use drugs who have a whole array of health needs and barriers to accessing care. We're deeply proud to work on this project in partnership with the city of Somerville in the effort to explore opening a supervised consumption site, which you'll hear more about tonight. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to share, to listen, and to learn. And our goal is to have a genuine, respectful, and meaningful community engagement process as we explore supervised consumption sites in Somerville. As you may know, Fenway was brought on by the city to develop a conceptual design of a supervised consumption site, to explore location options, and to engage the community in this process. This work is ongoing, it is iterative, and we'll be sharing our final report for this phase of the work with the city later this month, which will be informed in part by what we learned from you all here tonight. 
I want to say explicitly that we are all partners in this work, whether you came to this topic with skepticism or support or curiosity, whether you are someone who uses or has used drugs in the past, or you're someone that loves someone who does use drugs and is worried about their health and safety, or whether you're a resident or a small business owner or community member wondering what this all means for you and for your community, you're all a part of saving lives by being part of this conversation. This process will be better informed by your engagement and your perspective, whatever that might be. So thank you for being a part of this process. So with that, let me again say thank you for being here and participating and learning. It's now my pleasure to invite Mayor Katiana Ballantyne to share a few words. Mayor Ballantyne has been an ally with us in this work and in particular championing the importance of meaningful dialogue and community engagement. Mayor Ballantyne, thank you for your leadership. The floor is yours. Thank you, Carl. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the city of Somerville, thank you for joining us for this discussion on supervised consumption sites. I also want to um, acknowledge my partners in government at the state level that Representative Christine Barber is here and two former aldermen, Bobby McWaters and Jack Conley are with us this evening. Um, Carl, again, thank you, and to your colleagues at Fenway Health for partnering with the city on this event. Since January, Fenway Health has convened an advisory committee to explore how supervised consumption sites might operate in Somerville. They have engaged our residents in conversations about this issue, conversations like the one we're having tonight. Thank you to the members of the advisory committee for your thoughtful work. I also want to thank our panelists for sharing their insight and wisdom with us this evening. And in particular, I'd like to thank our pan panelists with lived experience for their leadership in this process. Tonight, we'll learn more about what a supervised consumption site is, how they operate, and the panelists will take questions from you, our residents. I'm looking forward to learning alongside you. Because the truth is, I am still learning about this issue. When I took office in January, I asked Matt Mitchell, our prevention services manager, what is the current impact of overdoses in our community? Matt will talk about this in more detail in a few minutes, but the short answer is, we lose anywhere from 15 to 20 people to fatal overdoses every year. Each one of these individuals leaves behind loved ones, friends, and family. Their loss leaves a hole in our community, a hole that often goes unacknowledged. I know that hole got wider recently due to the loss of several individuals to fatal overdoses. My sincerest condolences to those who love them best. If, imagine, if you will, that these community members had died in a vehicle or pedestrian accident. If we lose 15 to 20 people a year in traffic accidents, we would be up in arms as a community to make necessary changes. And if you're not aware of it, the city already has a Vision Zero Action Plan to build towards a goal of zero deaths from traffic-related accidents. But the way we talk about drug use and overdoses is different because of stigma, because of what our society thinks of people who use drugs because of a history of systematic racism and, brutal, and the brutal war on drugs. We have a lot of work to do in our community to shift from a punitive mindset to a public health one. I know many of you have concerns about what a supervised consumption site will bring to your neighborhood. And I will leave it up to our panel of experts to speak to some of those concerns this evening. But if there's only one thing you take away from this conversation, it's that we need, we need to hear from you. We need you to ask us those tough questions. 
We need you to listen with an open mind. Everyone in this room has a role to play, to be part of the solution. Tonight, we embark on a new Vision Zero, a vision towards comprehensive services, public health solutions, and most of all, a future with zero fatal overdoses. Thank you for being here and for being part of that vision. Thank you so much, Mayor Valentine. And next up, I'd like to introduce Matt Mitchell. Matt is the Director of Prevention Services in the City of Somerville in the Health Department. Matt. Thank you, Carl. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Matt Mitchell. I'm the Prevention Services Manager and a licensed social worker with the City of Somerville's Health and Human Services Department, working in our Somerville Prevention Services Division. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. To build off Mayor Ballantyne's comments, in 2021, the city conducted a needs assessment and feasibility study to explore the possibility of opening a supervised consumption site. According to the Somerville report, which was published in June of 2021, Somerville's overdose rates increased more than fivefold between 2012 and 2018. And each year, the city's first responders attend to more than 100 overdose calls. Earlier this year, the city contracted with Fenway Health, as mentioned, to develop conceptual design, explore location options, and engage the community in this process. The city has worked hard to address the opioid epidemic at the community level. Since 2019, we have completed upwards of 75 overdose prevention trainings that continue to be open to all community residents uh, and businesses. Since July 2020, we've partnered with the Somerville Homeless Coalition and Fenway Health uh, Access Drug User Health Program to conduct more than 175 overdose prevention trainings through outreach efforts for individuals experiencing homelessness and indoor housing instability. Uh, in addition, the city's Community Outreach Health and Recovery Unit has been able to conduct numerous post-overdose follow-ups to individuals who have experienced an overdose with resources for them and their family members. And we've also distributed more than 800 doses of Narcan to community members since 2019, as well as fentanyl test strips and face shields for rescue breathing. If you're interested in receiving any of those items or trainings, just please email me at mmitchell at somervillema.gov. And yet with these efforts, Somerville residents are still dying. As we wait to hear about the 2021 data from the state, there were 14 individuals in 2020, and at least four in the last month who've passed away from overdose. That is why we're here tonight, to continue to figure out how we can save lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. So next we're going to hear from Dr. Miriam Harris. Dr. Harris is the Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine and an addiction expert at Boston Medical Center to share with us more about harm reduction and what supervised consumption sites are. Dr. Harris. Thank you, Carl. Um, and uh, thank you for having me here this evening and giving me the opportunity to be a part of this panel and to talk about harm reduction and specifically safe consumption sites, which are tenants of care and policies that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just put up a couple of slides as I'm speaking because I find visual aids helpful and hopefully uh, some people will as well. Oh, you can probably see the presenter view and I just want to have the actual regular view. Um, so as Carl really eloquently introduced, as well as May and Valentine, our, our present approach to substance use and particularly public substance use has really relied on punitive practices and incarcerating and policing people who are using drugs. And instead of having the intended consequences of reducing harms and substance use, we're really in a situation where actually um, the exact opposite has been achieved, evidenced by the worsening opioid overdose epidemic, as well as uh, the HIV active outbreak that we're experiencing here in Massachusetts. 
And overdose deaths in particular are really a very small tip of the iceberg of the harms associated with substance use. Um, there are a range of other uh, very preventable issues um, that can be addressed, um, particularly by a different approach, specifically harm reduction, um, which offers an alternate strategy, uh, which really relies on focusing on respect, dignity, and compassion. We as community members and public policymakers are really familiar with harm reduction. This is a tenet of practices that we have put into place in multiple areas of public health and prevention. For example, I'm sure most people here have and continue to use sunscreen on hot sunny days, wear seatbelts when driving, respect speed limits, use birth control and condoms in, uh, when having sex if wanting to avoid uh, pregnancy or other sexually transmitted infections. We um, have put cigarette filters on cigarettes, uh, recognizing that some people are still going to choose to smoke, um, but they should do so with less harm. Um, and so these are all practices uh, that are very familiar to us and very common and very accepted. And harm reduction when it comes to substance use and drug use is really uh, putting the set of those same principles in place for people who use drugs. Um, and harm reduction really focuses on safety, self-efficacy and empowerment and independence, which is uh, for all of us something we need to be able to control our own health and wellness and, and people who use drugs are no different. And I think that um, harm reduction is often put in opposition to or in juxtaposition with recovery, which can mean a lot of different things, including ongoing drug use for people with substance use disorders or people who use drugs. But I, I think it's actually a really complementary and ongoing uh, practice that supports recovery in, in all of its very variable forms rather than uh, takes away from recovery. Um, and the evidence uh, really shows this also to be true um, as well as my own clinical practices and experiences. Um, and I think this is because again, harm reduction is a practice that's really focused on respect and empowerment and um, achieving positive change in all of our lives, whether it is with type two diabetes control or with someone who's injecting drugs, really relies on us being partners with those people who are experiencing those conditions and allowing them to take control and empower themselves to uh, be as healthy and well as possible. Safe consumption sites specifically are a very concrete form of harm reduction and a visible form of harm reduction, which I think is also why they experience sort of very intense opposition. Um, and these are some of the principles and um, structures that safe consumption spaces offer. So they're often buildings or physical spaces where people who use drugs can go and access a safe environment. And, and what that means is they can access not only um, an environment where they'll have the tools to, for example, use drugs and do so more safely, like injection equipment or uh, clean or sterile smoking equipment, but also in an environment that is safe and stress-free, where they're not being policed, where they're not alone, um, and where it's calm and, and uh, safe and relaxing and where people can feel also to have a sense of dignity. The other tool that safe consumption spaces offer um, is immediate uh, access to professionals who have an ability to um, appreciate and then address overdose or peri-overdose as it's occurring to prevent fatal overdose. Um, those same people, as well as other people who use these spaces can be really excellent resources for education, giving information about the potential harms associated with substance use 
or offering safer injection practices for people who are injecting drugs. And safe consumption spaces can also be very um, clear and uh, adequate conduits to other resources. And this includes things like addiction treatment, but also housing services, social welfare programs, and other connections to, for example, primary care or emergency services, uh, such should someone see, need those. There are many studies on safe consumption spaces, predominantly out of Europe and Canada. And some of the really well-described benefits um, include fewer overdose deaths, reduced sharing of needles um, or reusing needles, which can reduce uh, community incidence of HIV and hepatitis C, as well as other uh, infections like skin and soft tissue infections and increase access to services, specifically addiction treatment services, things like detox or uh, treatment with medications for opioid use disorder like Suboxone or Methadone here in the United States. There's also been studies to assess um, what are the impacts of safe consumption spaces on the communities in which they've been established. And the findings have been that they show there are fewer discarded needles and usually less public drug use. Um, and so overall generally benefits to the community as well. So safe consumption spaces have these benefits and they've also explored um, harms or unintended consequences um, of fear uh, amongst community members and other uh, substance use treatment experts uh, were that such spaces might be seen to encourage substance use or encourage people to use drugs, um, but that really has not been the case. And like I said, in fact, it's really quite the opposite. Um, by creating a space of dignity and respect um, that's connected with services, um, people who access safe consumption spaces are more likely to access addiction treatment, not less. And they don't encourage young people or any other people to start using drugs. Um, this is a picture of a safe consumption space in Calgary, Alberta. Miriam, we can't see your slides actually. Oh, you can't? No. Oh. Um, I think you pulled them down, I'm sorry. That's okay. Here. Um, so this is a picture of a safe consumption space in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and I like to use this as an example because I think most people are familiar with the safe consumption space in Vancouver, um, British Columbia, which is known as Insight. Um, but as you can see, it's a fairly unassuming entrance and building. Um, it's in a building with other health and community uh, resources. And in fact, this is what we would call an embedded uh, safe consumption state, meaning that there are a bunch of sort of wraparound services affiliated with this program. And so someone accessing this program would enter the door and then be able to access a variety of services including a safe consumption space room where they may choose to inject drugs under observation uh, from someone with the ability to respond to an overdose or another complication of drug use. Um, and as you can see, it's a, again, a very unassuming space. It's not necessarily a very large space, um, um, but it's clean, it's safe, it's private, um, and it has all of the uh, benefits that would go along with having a clean, private, safe, sort of unrushed space to use a drug and do so safely. Um, and so that sort of wraps up what I wanted to share about safe consumption spaces. Um, as a practitioner here in the United States, coming from Canada, where I also practiced, uh, I really miss being able to work in partnership with safe consumption spaces. 
connect with my patients there and also the community that develops out of creating these spaces. I think we are missing not only many opportunities to save lives, but also many opportunities to establish new relationships with people who are not accessing our current services. We know in Massachusetts specifically that about a third of people who have had either a fatal or non-fatal overdose have not accessed any form of healthcare. And that includes emergency department services. So if we don't start thinking outside the box, we are going to continue to miss opportunities to engage with people who are not benefiting from the current resources that we are offering. And that includes things like increasing things like residential treatment or detox programs. I am not sure that we will reach the people who are going to, again, experience a fatal or non-fatal overdose here in our state. And this is just another tool to be able to reach those who are not reaching and offer a place of safety and respect and kindness for people who are using drugs. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. And I want to next introduce a special guest from New York City, um, Sam Rivera, who's the executive director of On Point New York. Some of you may have read in the news in the last several months, New York City is now the first city in the United States to be opening and operating supervised consumption sites. And Sam is the executive director of the programs themselves that are up and running. So Sam, welcome and thank you for sharing your perspective. Good evening and um, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And while I'm a New Yorker, I wanna be clear, I'm not a New York Yankees fan. So uh, don't put me in that group. I appreciate that. Um, so a couple of, I mean, I was just really deeply receiving uh, Dr. Harris's points. And, and uh, there were many things said, uh, she said around what can happen, I'm gonna tell you what's happening because those things are happening. Um, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly so we can get into questions and answers. I really wanna engage with folks here, especially after reading some of the, <laughs> the questions listed and, and, and things that, uh, that we've um, had to address ourselves. So I'm gonna talk about facts. I'm gonna, I'm not, you know, opinions are interesting, but this is gonna be about what's actually happening. So again, thank you for having me. So truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, Monday marks six months since we opened this past Monday. Uh, we've seen uh, over 1,300 individual participants, unique individuals who are participating in our program. Um, of those 1,300, they've had over 22,000 uh, uh, um, uh, interactions with the, with, with the actual safe consumption site itself. Um, and of that, we've had 300 and over 315 overdose interventions in only six months. Um, no one has died. That still remains uh, uh, the consistent uh, process and the consistent um, uh, life-saving program that we're offering that's been offered uh, around the world for over 30 years. Um, something very quickly, 100% of our participants, 100% have been to detox and treatment. So when people say to us, Send them the treatment, send them the detox, you're, you're just enabling them. Well, they've been to detox and treatment. And what we know factually is that most people, and I mean a very, very high percentage of people, do not go to detox and treatment the first time and get it. It just doesn't, it's just not the way it works. Uh, many, many people need multiple opportunities to get there. Um, one thing I'll say is I heard this uh, earlier, I think Carl said something about the war on drugs. For me, there's no war on drugs, there's a war on drug users. Um, if there were a war on drugs, we, you know, we watch these shows where you're, you're uh, you know, we're watching someone get arrested on coming off a plane with half a kilo of, of, of drugs. That's not the issue. The drugs are coming in much bigger uh, at, a, at a much higher rate, not on a, on, a, on a public plane where people are coming off. So, so please wake up and not be fooled by that. Um, so there's not a war on drugs. Um, so I want to give a couple of other quick highlights. The impact Dr. Harris was talking about is actually happening in New York. What I've been telling the two communities when, so we in two communities, we have a, what we call a medical model and a peer model. Um, in, in East Harlem, we have the medical model and in Washington Heights, we have the peer model. 
right be before we open, we know that safe consumption sites, what they do is, is, is a number of things, but most importantly, they keep people alive. And what we know is anyone who's ever used the drugs and, and died of an overdose didn't have to. They just didn't have to. So we uh, took a moment before we opened and put a candle at every booth for those who, who couldn't be there who we lost to an overdose, who really shouldn't, who we shouldn't have lost. Um, what we're looking at is an, a health intervention that keeps people alive. Does it, from a distant sound out there and, and radical, I totally understand and respect that. I can see why people see it that way. I totally get it. If you get a chance to come in and visit, you'll see, you'll see what the magic is. You'll see what happened. You'll see the importance of people that too many people view as disposable. For us, there are our brothers, sisters, fathers, husbands, boyfriends, lovers, everything. They're beautiful people who wanna be alive. What we know is that most, most people who use drugs are self-medicating pain, you know, traumatic experiences, et cetera, or mental health conditions. It's not as simple as you, know, you stop using and life just turns great. Or if you go to a meeting and they say, this is Bill, and he stopped using four years ago and he has a house and a picket fence and a poodle and life is great. People stop using, they find themselves sitting in a place going, what is this? What is all this stuff happening to me? Because we're not spending enough time uh, working them through that process and why they're using. And that's the biggest uh, question for each individual. Currently, we are unable to pay for staff who are working in the OPC, uh, Overdose Prevention Center, Safe Consumption Site, uh, we don't use supervised consumption site, we use safe consumption site. We are unable to pay them through any kind of funding because federally it's still illegal. And I think someone asked that question. Um, what keeps it illegal is a statute called the Krakow statute, something the president, the current president is proud of uh, creating years ago. What we know is once you make cocaine into crack, once you, you instead of calling it cocaine, you call it crack, it's a it becomes a black and brown and poor white issue. That's intentional. That language is intentional. What I've reminded Joe Biden and, 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 and Raul Gupta from ONDCP is that we're in America and we're it's a land of second chances. And I'm looking forward to him waking up and realizing that people are dying specifically because they don't have access to safe cons consumption site. They don't have access to a place where people care about them and see them as the humans they are and not as the drug user, all these other uh, names we call people in place of who they really are. We, I wanna talk quickly about a couple of, of impacts we've had already. We have a park, a large park across the street from our uh, um, Washington Heights site. That park was averaging, we have a partnership with the Parks Department, New York Park, Parks Department. That park was averaging 13,000 syringes a month, collected, 13,000. Since we've opened, that park is now averaging 1,000 syringes. So if you have a drug problem in your community, if you have a, a need to service folks, this is the opportunity and this is the intervention, the health intervention that's needed. We know it's working. We, uh, it's very important as well for us. We provide an array of services that are embedded and, uh, and attached to uh, the safe consumption site. So um, medical service, low threshold medical services, access to mat, um, Suboxone, access to acupuncture, acupressure, other health uh, interventions that are not normally used by our folks because it's uh, extremely expensive. Uh, case management, housing assistance, healthy, uh, nutritious meals, et cetera, et cetera. Access to computers, showers, and laundry. We will not shower them, but we will do their laundry. Um, and, and, and if you've ever worked with folks who are, who are street homeless, and really, really struggling through this process, a shower can really, really change their lives uh, in a way that most of us take for granted. Um, it's been six months, there's been six months of, of love in a way that, that um, I personally have never seen. We know we're reducing the very, very high rates of, of hepatitis and STDs and of course HIV as well. We know that we are keeping people beautiful people who want to stay alive, alive. Um, I don't have the numbers yet, but we have had a number of people at a booth while using at a booth say, right now I want to go to detox. I want to try something different. I want to get on Suboxone. I want a difference. Why? They're in a room with people who care about them. They're sharing space 
with people who care about them. They become a part of a community. People are using less just because they're in the room. So very quickly, when someone shows up, they say, I'm here to use. Um, I don't show a picture of the outside of, of our location and say, this is a safe consumption site. No, this is an organization with a safe consumption site. It is not the entire site. Our safe consumption site is one program within an entire organization. Um, and it has to be embedded. So when you come in and you say you're going to use, you say, I'm going to, um, you, you tell us what you're going to use, how you're going to use it. And we ask questions like, if you weren't here, where would you be using? Very important because we find out some really key information like at a local bathroom or in an alley or at a park. We're reducing that. The community is extremely excited uh, from the impact we've had. The police department who we partner with very closely is excited because of the impact we had. The local schools are excited. So, you know, the, the, the reality is that the impact has the, the projected things we hope we will receive, and then a ton of unexpected benefits, things we didn't really uh, necessarily think about, but we're living with them now. Um, it takes beautiful folks to do this work. I'm blessed with some, uh, some of the most amazing staff on the planet. Uh, and, and it's really a way as an indigenous person, as a Native American, it's really about that village approach and everyone uh, loving folks when they don't love themselves and being there in a way that uh, too many of our people haven't experienced. So I think I'll stop there. Oh, oh very, very, very important. I wanna just say for those of you who understand uh, how to respond to an overdose. Of the 300 and over, 50, over, over 315 overdose interventions we, we've uh, uh, participated in, we um uh we've only we're only using narcan about 15 to 20 percent of the time uh, we're using other forms we're using oxygen every time and we're using agitation in other ways to to respond to an overdose all of our staff data folks uh fiscal <laughs> fiscal staff maintenance staff and of course direct line staff all of our staff are, are, are trained to respond to an overdose at the level of an rn um, it's been documented many times. We've had multiple visitors come in and an overdose happened in front of them uh, and, they, and they got to see our staff in action. So it's truly been a blessing uh, to offer these services. And again, in my Taino language, you say, home. thank you for having me in your space. And um, I appreciate being here. Sam, thank you for joining us and for your, for your leadership and vision for the work that you're doing in New York. It's really remarkable. A few of us had a chance to go visit and tour and, and really learned a lot just by seeing how it works and just appreciate the respect and dignity that you give to the people that you serve. So welcome and thank you. Um, next up, so just so folks in the audience know, we have a brief video compiled about Somerville residents talking about their experience with this issue that we'll show. It's about a five minute long video. We have a few folks on a panel that will share and introduce themselves about why they're working on this effort. And then we'll be getting to the questions. So thank you for your patience. And uh, if I can invite Adriana, I believe, will be queuing up the video. Well, I grew up here in Somerville. Um, several people that I know have passed away in uh, bathrooms to public restaurants. Uh, they've died in their own homes. They've died when their friends abandoned them in the middle of the street. And these are all places that are unsafe consumption sites. And there's needles in the park. Uh, I think if we had safe consumption sites, that would be something that could be addressed uh, because it'd be a sterile environment dealt with by professionals. You know, our first responders are charged with running all over the city, going to people's houses, going to public bathrooms, going to alleyways and finding people overdosing and saving them. Uh, that's a huge drain on resources for the city. They're already using the drug. So it's not like someone's gonna see a safe consumption site and decide to take up heroin. I think we need to look at this as a public safety issue and treat the people as if they had a sickness, which is the case. And I don't think people walk by a hospital and say, you know, they wanna get into a bed in the hospital. They, they, so they say that's where people go when they're sick. And I think that's the same thing with safe consumption sites. I did lose my son, Jeff, to an overdose on February 5th, 2017. He had struggled with substance use disorder for nearly 10 years. Um, I am a believer now in the harm reduction tool of supervised consumption sites. I was not at the time. 
Um, I have to be honest with you. I thought every day is a new day. If they're alive, there's always a chance for recovery. And um, if the overdose prevention sites are manned with the appropriate personnel and staff, I believe that the compassion and the love is enough to keep these people coming back, bring up their self-esteem, develop relationships, and be open to wraparound services. These people are using not to get high, they're using not to get sick. I can easily remember a time when things like distribution of naloxone were considered uh, bizarre and exotic, and why would you do such a thing? And now we're in an era where that is just so so common and saving so many lives. Safe consumption sites are the same. They have um, excellent evidence for their benefit, for saving lives, um, for engaging people in treatment if they're interested in treatment, for helping to prevent spread of infectious diseases. We can be leaders in the country if we can pass this legislation. Let's look at the real evidence here. Over the past decade, whether it be in Canada, Germany, other European countries, these safer consumption sites have fostered better health. People get clean needles. People are observed. These are millions of injections that have occurred over this period of time, and they haven't died. For example, in Toronto, where I went to a consumption site, and it was clean, it was accessible, and there was that place where people could get treatment for their opioid addiction, but they could also have that opportunity to safely consume, to have somebody observe them for that 10 or 15 minutes when that overdose might happen. They're a link not just to addiction treatment, but as I said, to treatment for other medical conditions, which I have seen uh, clinically and reported in the literature as well. Safe consumption spaces, present an opportunity for us to reach people who we are not reaching in the traditional healthcare system. There's an excellent study published from Massachusetts by some of my colleagues, um, Alex Wally and Mark Rochelle and others, showing that within our healthcare system, about 50% of overdose deaths could be prevented if we identify people with substance use disorders and sort of engage them in care incarcerate people to the point where they're not getting the help that they need and that they deserve, which is a real disservice to those individuals, to their families, and to their communities. So I had a complete 180 on how I feel about what we need to address um, addiction in our state and in our country. And that's where I came to really support the idea of safe consumption sites, looking at the evidence, knowing that they save lives, they increase access to treatment, and they treat people humanely because they are connecting people to the care and the services that they really need when they need it. To watch their mother struggle, but through the grace of God, is so right. That's Thank you. So next we have a panel of a few folks who are going to share what brings them to this work, what their perspective is on this issue, and then we'll open it up for questions. I appreciate everyone's patience. I know we've gone a little over time this evening, what we anticipated. We are scheduled to go until 730. And again, if you do need to drop off, we'll send an email in follow up to everyone that registered with the link to the video once we post it online as well. Just want to mention that as well in case people have other obligations. But next up, I want to introduce uh, in this order, first Daniel Hogan Rigg, then TJ Thompson, then Stephen Kelly, and then Stephen Murray to introduce yourselves in that order and share what brings you to this work. So Daniel. Hey all, thanks for uh, attending tonight. This is you know, an important issue and uh, part of, uh, so my name is Dan Hogan Rigg, um, a clinician at Boston Medical Center, I'm a Somerville resident. I'm also an addict in recovery um, from heroin use and homelessness. And part of what brings me to this work is, you know, going through the experiences of getting uh, into recovery, um, of having times where uh, I struggled, where uh, I didn't know how to access treatment, um, you know, 
when I was trying to get into to care, I often found that um, I, I didn't really know people in the substance in the addiction recovery world in the traditional sense, and uh, I found it often difficult to access services. Um, that's part of what made me, when I was able to uh, engage in recovery and you know get clean, I was able to. Um, I, I decided I wanted to go back and do this work, you know, as as my career. Um, Service work is an important part of recovery. And I was thinking about um, when Sam was speaking earlier, um, one of the things that you know you see when you work in this profession, you see a lot of people that had personal experience uh, with addiction and recovery. And by providing um, you know, different types of programs that allows people uh, to give back, to be of service to other people in a way that um, often helps people feel heard. Um, I think about, you know, when I think about a, a safe consumption site, what I really think about is a multi-service center. And it's a multi-service center that happens to also provide people a safe place to use. But first and foremost, this is a place that people can engage with support that they may need. It's a place that they can come together and not feel completely alone or, or stigmatized. Um, and that's really important. That's something that keeps people engaging in services, that keeps people wanting to, to stay on a path that um, ultimately is, is, is helping, that, that, that's, you know, that, that leads to health and, and, and ultimately, hopefully, happiness. Um, I think human connection is one of the things that addiction often robs us of when we're using. And you know, I think about our context right now, you know, post-pandemic, we all know what it's like to feel really alone and the despair that can come along with that. You know, for a lot of the folks that I work with, that's everyday life. And a place like this, I think, is important uh, to explore because we're clearly not having, you know, great outcomes. You know, we see overdose deaths rising and rising. Um, we know that, you know, despite the fact that most people know that fentanyl is all over the place in the drugs, not just in heroin, cocaine, and meth, it's, 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 it's everywhere, but people continue to use. Why? because of suffering. And as a society, we need to look at that suffering and understand that this is something that, you know, requires innovation and, you know, exploring new ideas and new ways to address stuff. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but I'll be, you know, happy to engage in the Q&A part, but thank you for letting me speak. Thanks, Dan. TJ? Hi, my name is TJ Thompson. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm here tonight. I came here because I was on the Somerville Task Force last year. I was a peer research associate for the Needs and Feasibility Report. I'm currently um, on the Substance Use Advisory Committee for the city of Cambridge as well. So I'm trying to open an SCS in both cities, which is fantastic and really exciting. And I don't really want to take up much time to talk about myself because I'm here to answer questions. So I'm going to just pass it on. Thanks, TJ. Stephen Kelly. Hey, guys. My name is um, Stephen Kelly. I am here because I was also on the task force last year, and I was also a peer researcher for the Needs and Feasibility Report. Um, I am a person with lived experience. I've done, well, whatever. But um, so yeah this cause means everything to me i mean i just recently witnessed an open casket funeral because of my friend passing away and i'm just it, it, like the time for this is over for debate like it needs to happen now is how i feel thank you thanks Stephen. Stephen murray hi good evening everyone thanks for having me um and thanks to my fellow panelists for sharing their lived experience i think it's really important to hear from those of us who've lived through um, overdose and addiction. Uh, my name is Stephen Murray. I'm currently uh, an overdose researcher at Boston Medical Center. Um, I have a pretty significant background in EMS. So I was a lieutenant and paramedic here in Northern Berkshire County. Um, I personally responded to more than 100 overdoses in my career. And um, I, I, I'm here for a couple, of, a couple of big reasons. I guess the first is that uh, I, I've told a lot of parents and um, spouses and children that the people that they love are dead um, and that there's nothing that we can do to get to bring them back. And it was always one of the hardest parts uh, of the job where um, the, the, the route to any sort of positive change had come to an end. And then seeing that ripple effect go back out into the community, um, kids without parents and uh, parents burying their children. Um, I 
also myself, I'm an overdose survivor. I've been in long-term recovery. I'm coming up on 11 years. Um, and one thing I can tell you about being in long-term recovery is that uh, when you make it this long, uh, all of your friends have died. Um, there's nobody left. And it is a depressing hill to stand on knowing that everybody that I use drugs with is no longer with us. And actually the last person from my group died a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so um, I, I uh, yeah, I, I think one other thing I just wanna bring up too, uh, it hasn't really been talked about too much. A lot of people talk about um, substance use disorder and addiction in the context of overdose. But I think it's also important to note that not all people who use drugs have a substance use disorder and that people will be accessing these sites who are recreationally using substances as well. Um, we have some pretty concerning data here in Massachusetts, thanks to the Massachusetts Drug Supply Data Stream, which shows that 25% of powder cocaine is currently fentanyl contaminated here in Massachusetts, as well as 26% of counterfeit pills. So if you're the parent of a high school or a college age kid, and they are using Adderall in order to study uh, for exams, which is pretty widespread in colleges, um, they may buy a pill that's fentanyl contaminated and not realize it. And so I think that we need to be really cognizant of the fact that our drug supply has shifted and that these sites offer a way for people to, to use in a supervised and a safe space and to have drug checking services and testing services. Uh, this is a, a growing portion of the epidemic um, of the overdose epidemic. And I think that these sites do a, a really good job of offering an alternative and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all of you. And in particular for sharing some challenging experiences you've had in recent weeks and days. So appreciate your, your openness to sharing your, your lived experience and your life experience, um, each of you. So my colleague, Carrie Riggles, who is here on screen, uh, has the unenviable un un task of going through the questions. Uh, many of you that registered submitted questions in advance, so we're going to go so through some of those and we'll try to get to the questions in the Q&A as well. So Carrie will queue up the questions and we will see how far we can get through this. So thank you all for your patience. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, who submitted comments and questions um, and shared part of your story and why you have um, joined us this evening. So I just wanted to thank you and um, I'll get right to it. Um, so all of the questions um, from this section are from Somerville residents. Uh, so this first question is about staffing of these sites, uh, and it's for TJ, Stephen Murray, and Miriam. Uh, so the question was, will the site be staffed by nurses or drug counselors? Will it offer rehab, recovery coaches, or medical care or connection to medication-assisted treatment if needed? Um, so I just want to, um, there's a lot of parts to this. So uh, TJ, can you talk about your experience with uh, peer-led harm reduction outreach? Yeah, if I can unmute myself. Yes. Um, so um, there's been a lot of research. There's like a lot of um, going through the other um, overdose presents um, prevention sites um, and SCSs in the, around the world with peer workers and it's first off it's really helpful um not only for the people involved that are using this space but for the people that um get the chance to work there because the thing is people like a lot of times folks assume that people that are using drugs can't be useful in like um a position where they are working because like they're like oh well these people are you know these people are high or these people are not well but like that's not always the case and honestly sometimes like it's it's really helpful for someone that is like you know actively using to like have like you know something positive in their life to do and it's and one thing i do like to like i like i like to point out to people like you have to look at it like in a way where like you know you look at bartenders like you bartenders take shots like with their with their patrons um it's not always banned and it's not always looked down upon like you know so like you can responsibly be a bartender and consume alcohol at a bar and the same thing happens with like you know you have peers working alongside like other people that they know and so like not only like does it give someone a chance to like feel better about themselves make money and and be involved but like it's a trust building exercise where you have like 
people coming in and they trust the person that, that is working there because they know them and they have experience with them. And it builds a community that actually like lets people trust the space and stay and come back more. And like that's like one of the things like you want trust and trust is what brings people back to safe consumption sites or like even you know exchange programs like it's it's, it's a trust issue and the more trust and foundation you have the better help you're able to give to people excellent thank you so much tj uh, so the next part of this question is for stephen murray uh, can you tell us a bit more about your experience in this environment as a first responder and the kind of care that patients need beyond response to an overdose? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one thing worth noting is that uh, people don't overdose and die instantly. Um, it's a progression that starts with respiratory depression and then respiratory arrest and then cardiac arrest. And earlier on within that progression, the the possibilities for a positive neurological outcome are much greater. So people have a much better chance of surviving without having any sort of additional um, like bad outcome as a result of that overdose. And so overdose deaths in that sense are 100% preventable um, if it's being done, uh, if the overdose is occurring in front of somebody who knows how to respond. Um, I think that one thing that we know from other supervised consumption sites is that they help to reduce the number of overdoses that first responders are going to. Um, we, we were, when I first started in EMS, we were responding to a lot, um, sometimes 20 in uh, one weekend in our uh, city. And um, now it's a lot less, I think, thanks to Narcan being distributed around the community. And so that's been really good for lowering non-fatal overdose events, but it hasn't had an impact on fatal overdose events because the people who are at risk for a fatal overdose, uh, those who are using a loan, those who've just been released from treatment or incarceration, um, those folks don't, uh, don't benefit from somebody else having Narcan with them because there's nobody else with them. So um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. Um, just addressing um, primarily uh, the way that these sites offer an array of staffing um, options. And Miriam, you'll be next to talk a bit more about this. So Stephen, please continue if you wanted to add more. Sure, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that, you know, when we offer people services in the moments surrounding an overdose in the field, they are often not receptive to hearing anything that we have to say. And so um, it really, the, the appropriate place to talk to somebody about uh, recovery or different ways of making themselves more healthy is not in the five minutes or five hours that the person is in the emergency department. Um, these sites create, as, as Sam put really well, they create, and Miriam, they create long lasting relationships um, beyond just the one overdose event where people feel comfortable to ask for help and ask for services. Um, which is a, a, a way different experience than someone who's going in and out of the emergency department. Uh, but I'll kick the rest on, over to, to Dr. Harris, my colleague. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, so Miriam, can you speak a bit about your work uh, in as well as here in the Boston area with um, integrated medical services in these sites and the kind of uh, staff that are on hand in different models to offer services to folks when they need it? Yes, I think that it's a great question. And it's also a very community specific question um, because I think the foundation of these services must be the community. And I think that's why the work that Somerville has done over the past year in asking what Somerville wants and having that work led by people from the community, including people with lived or living experience is so critical. And Somerville residents were pretty clear in that report stating that they do want sort of services that are embedded or are at least have corridors to other um, health and wellness services outside of safe consumption or supervised consumption. Um, and I will echo what TJ said. I think that the tenant of any a harm reduction organization has to be uh, based in the community and has to be based in uh, people who use drugs and leaders in that community 
um, and they can keep us in the medical field accountable to the work and ensure what we're doing isn't re-stigmatizing or traumatizing because much of what we do now is. And without that really clear community connection and leadership, uh, we risk reinforcing that. Um, so I think um, I just wanna reinforce what TJ said. And then it would be uh, working in partnership with community members I think both nurses and um, other providers, nurse practitioners um, and physicians um, who may either be on site or offer telemedicine services, a combination of the above um, to people who are accessing those services uh, who may need urgent medical attention, peri overdose or post overdose, or who have other complications associated with their substance use like skin and soft tissue infections, or who are seeking immediate sort of treatment services or recovery services. And there's lots of good examples of this um, um, and which Sam can speak to. The, what they're doing in New York is amazing and it's totally reimagined even what has been done in Canada. And I think is an excellent model of not only a community-based program, but a program that is being led by people who use drugs and has some really innovative community outreach services and integrative medicine services that are so exciting and so innovative. And as a Canadian um, sort of mourning the loss of safe consumption spaces working in the United States, um, it's so amazing to see what can happen when a city like New York goes after this problem. I mean, everything is bigger in New York and so is their approach to overdose prevention and safe consumption. It's really truly inspiring. Um, so uh, I think they offer a great model um, and an exciting new model to think about. Wonderful, thank you, Miriam. Uh, there was also a request for more specific data on community impact um, and I will be providing um, quite a, a hefty list of material to all folks who registered um, through email. So um, please look forward to that um, if something that you asked is not uh, addressed. Um, so this next question on location is for Matt and Dan. Uh, and again, this is from a Somerville resident. Uh, I strongly believe that it should not be located within or next to residences, but should be with, it, with uh, commercial as SCS should not reside in a residential space, please consider a business area space or a big location with parking. Um, Matt, are you able to give a quick overview of the limitations on location in Somerville as we evaluated areas throughout the city? Uh, sure, and Carrie, if you could pull up the, the slide um, that you might have, might be helpful to see as well. Um, so, in uh, so right now, there's no specific site that has been identified yet. Um, in last year's report, it identified East Somerville and Davis Square as two recommended areas in general. Uh, and so we've been evaluating and exploring all the possible location options within those areas with the planning and the advisory group uh, this year. So more details are going to be shared in the final report that Fenway will be finalizing and submitting to the city um, at the end of this month. But Here's a good visual representation of some of the things that we are considering as we're looking at different locations, you know, accessibility, safety, um, sensitive abutters, legal issues, recommended locations, community buy-in and, and visibility. So um, when we have looked at this, we, there is a lot of factors that we need to consider. And um, we're doing that with all types of uh, feedback from community members and, and advocates uh, across the city. Excellent, thank you, Matt. Uh, so the next part of this question is for Dan. Um, what are some criteria for a site like this to be successful and also equitable for neighboring community members? Sure, I think that um, when we're considering a site like this, obviously transportation access is really important. Um, making sure that it's not disruptive to other things that are going on, but still accessible. Uh, you know, for folks that maybe do have to travel a little bit to get here. Um, you know, I think something to consider if you go into, you know, a Dunkin' Donuts bathroom or a Starbucks bathroom or, you know, any number of uh, public buildings like the MBTA, there are people using drugs in these spaces already and they're going in, they're using discreetly. Um, 
you know, maybe not so discreetly sometimes. I know there's been times that I've walked into bathrooms and found cookers and syringes on the ground or blood stains on the wall. Um, this kind of stuff is happening around us already. And by not sort of thinking about how uh, a service like this could actually help to contain some of that use and prevent it from being something that's taking place, you know, in a shop or, you know, in the subway station, you know, we're actually kind of choosing to allow these things to kind of continue in neighborhoods that we may not want it to. Um, so that's that's sort of what I, what I think about. I think, um, you know, what's most important is that, uh, this provides access for folks that need it, but that doesn't, in, you know, impinge on the, you know, people on, on other people's day to day lives. And I think, you know, and having worked with this team um, on this process, I know that that's being, you know, sincerely considered in all the spaces that are being looked at or considered for uh, used as Matt was uh, mentioning. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so this next question is about policing, safety, and crime, um, and it's for Miriam, Stephen, Kelly, and Sam. Um, so the question, again, came from a Somerville resident. Uh, why not focus on policing in Davis Square? What can be done if there's an increase in crime in the SES area? Uh, Sam, could you tell us a bit about your process uh, working with police in Harlem and Washington Heights, uh, engaging them in outreach and the effect it's had on the neighborhood safety and your program? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, there's a reduction in crime. There's a reduction in drug use, uh, public drug use. Um, I, I, again, I totally respect the, 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 the thoughts and, and what this looks like and what it could feel like for people. The reality is my favorite, um, especially recently, compliment has been, I forgot you guys were open. What people thought were going to, was going to happen just isn't. It just isn't, guys. And, and believe me, I, I'm, you know, I want to be clear that I respect your, your concerns. It's just not the reality. What we're seeing is what I've, what I've told the communities both in, in Harlem and Washington Heights is I responded to your request. And they were like, we didn't make a request. I'm like, you did. You said you didn't want drug use, and as, as Dan just mentioned, in the local bathrooms and in the local parks and alleys. We responded to that. You didn't want paraphernalia at your schools or in the street. We responded to that. Everyone who uses our site, uh, their, their paraphernalia stays with us. Um, so, so and, and to add more to the other part of the question, we have a partnership with the police department. They are grateful. They've thanked us profusely. They asked us to create these cards so they can give to someone if they see them using to tell them, come inside and use. I, I'd like you to try as much as possible to imagine this happening in your, I'm sure it's happening in these communities. You know, I don't think you want to open one because there's no drug use. I'm sure there's drug use. So I want you to imagine those folks no longer, for those of you homeowners and you're concerned about property value, et cetera, they will be inside. I used to say we were crazy enough to bring them in. I say we're courageous enough to bring them in. Let us love our people. Those of us who are willing to do this work, let us love them. Uh, the great doctors who want to do it, there are people who don't want to do it. Wonderful. But for those of us who do, allow us to do it. Allow us to love on people who want to be loved. And, 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 and I want to explain something very quickly. I have many, many friends and family in recovery, multiple years of recovery. And what they say is, no, it's not going to enable what they say. But if I were using drugs today with fentanyl, fentanyl is in everything. If I were using drugs today with fentanyl, the way fentanyl is in, in, in everything, I would never want to use alone because I have no idea what's going to happen. This is just a fact. This is a different world we're in. 107,000 overdose deaths in this country, specifically really impacted by fentanyl. So... If we're going to think it's okay for people to continue using on their own, outside hiding, that number is only going to increase. And so uh, those relationships matter. Those relationships with the police matter. Um, they're able to call me if they have a concern. We talk about those concerns. I address them. It's really a relationship between the organization, the local police department, and the community. When you open, not if, when you open, you invite the community in. Let them see it. Let them walk through it. Let them own it as if it's their place. And then be open to, to their criticism and concerns and questions. 
Um, and, and I promise you, it's going to be absolutely mind blowing. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing that. Um, and this next part is for Stephen Kelly. Um, could you talk a bit about the effect of policing on the lives of people who use drugs and people who are unhoused, particularly the perceived connection between, between police and safety? Yeah, well, I mean, the perceived version is it's not safe for the two to be together. So what we want to create is like a, a barrier between police, like what we're trying to get going is like, so that the police can't just arrest anyone who walks in or out of that place. Like, so we're trying to build up that um, relationship with them. We've had some success, a good amount of success actually. So we're just hoping to stick to that level and hopefully make it a little bit better, I guess. But I mean, the police are the police, they're gonna be there. Um, but they can't, they won't be able to like, um, actually be standing outside of the SES, like hustling people or anything like that. We're not going to allow that. That is, that is definitely something we're gonna to have to reach to a complete conclusion before we can open. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Miriam, your portion is a little bit covered. So for the sake of time, uh, I'm gonna to move to the next question if that's all right. Okay. Uh, so this next question is about community impact response and feedback. Um, this person says, I want to know what metrics will be in place to measure impacts to the local community and planned response to metrics, specifically discarded needles. Uh, Sam, you've already touched a bit on um, the decrease in needles in your area. Um, can, what has the response been from other community members in your area? Yeah, so we are um, breaking records as far as uh, cost because we have to, we're, we're, we take um, all of the uh, paraphernalia and we're disposing of it through a uh, through a company we use and the numbers are pretty outrageous. One of the things we did, and it wasn't pompous in any way, uh, but we opened November 30th uh, for Christmas. We took all of the paraphernalia. They were in these, you know, in the um, safe consumption, the way you put them into the, into these, uh, 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 you know, containers. And we built a tree, a Christmas tree for each site. that said, look, this is our gift back to your community. And people really were kind of like, okay, man, okay. You know, okay, this is working. Um, so it's really, it, it's what we want to watch as harm reductionists. And I think I said this the other day is not, you know, we always had to be aggressive, right? Because people can't hear us and they don't understand how much we love the folks we work with. We presented that stuff in a loving way. When people want to question what we're doing, I listen to them and take it in. Come visit. Let me walk you through the process. Let me show you that people are staying alive. And again, as I said before, Allow us to love on our people. If you don't want to love them and participate, that's fine. Allow us to do it. We're not asking for your participation. We're asking for your understanding. We're asking for your compassion for people in general and allow us to do our work. Um, I, you know, I grew up with a mom who was an RN in New York City for 40 years. I spent many, 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 many days doing homework in the ER next to her. And I used to wonder, and I used to ask her like, mom, that guy keeps coming back here. I saw him the other day. He doesn't care about himself. Why are you taking care of him? He goes, it's my responsibility to care for himself until he's ready to care for himself. And it's something that stuck with me for years. And my mom is my idol. Um, she's the greatest woman on the planet. And I'm blessed to be able to carry her, her message forward. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the work we're, we're doing and you guys get to do will have an impact and many, many impacts that uh, you might not think of. Uh, but there is a huge reduction, huge reduction in syringe litter and other paraphernalia that happens immediately. By the way, we're only open from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. now. We're going to open to 11.30 p.m. and then 24 hours, and that number is going to drop even more. There will basically be no syringe or paraphernalia litter in those two communities. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, so this, um, I'm going to um, go a little quickly through these questions because there have been really good topics brought up. Um, 
and um, sort of turn the tables on our MC, Carl Sartino. <laughs> um, and uh, there have been quite a few questions in the chat about the legal aspects of this. Um, what are the state and federal departments support for these sites? What sort of liability protection could sites uh, offer? And what has been the response from the Massachusetts Attorney General or the US Attorney? So Carl, could you speak a bit uh, briefly to the uh, legal uh, landscape right now? Sure, so the short answer is the legal landscape is rapidly changing in the direction of supporting the opening of supervised consumption sites in the United States. The fact that New York has been able to open as the first site in the country shows us an example of what the federal government is doing, which is nothing. What they're saying is we're evaluating this with a harm reduction, public safety, public health approach. There was a few years ago in Philadelphia, an attempt to open a supervised consumption site under the, under the Trump administration, the federal department of justice brought them to court and they the program won at the lower court, lost at the appeals court, and they're now in settlement discussions with the Department of Justice. So the DOJ federally is evaluating this policy and actually asking the question, why would a policy, a racist policy from the 80s, the crack house statute, be used to prevent clinical life-saving interventions, medical interventions, harm reduction interventions? This is not what the crack house statute was intended to go after. So that movement is happening pretty rapidly at the federal level. At the state level, we've been advocating for the passage of legislation to create a legal framework so that the Department of Public Health can fund and establish these with local approval. This is exactly the parallel that we have done with syringe exchange. Um, in the early 1990s at the height of the AIDS crisis, when again, people were dying, it spurred local communities to say we want to save lives and demanded the legislature create a framework to create uh, regulations, to create a structure to actually allow this to happen at a state level. Um, that effort is being paralleled now with supervised consumption sites. But let me just point out, the possession of syringes, the passing out of syringes is not illegal. It is something that we are allowed to do in the state. We do it through our syringe exchange programs every single day. When someone is in the presence of somebody else who is overdosing, they have the right under the Good Samaritan law under the state to call 911 without prosecution because the state already recognizes that saving a life is far more important than the fact that someone happens to be using drugs that led to that overdose, that people should be incentivized to call 911. Essentially what we're trying to do is create a legal framework at the state level where we can create a physical space that is essentially a space where the Good Samaritan law applies to the activity that's happening within that space. So this is not frankly that far from what is currently in state law. That being said, this is a this is a transition period for us as a country and for us as, uh, as a state. So we do have people obviously that are still learning about this issue, still opposed to this issue, still curious about this issue. And part of our job is to make the case that saving lives, having a clinical program, having a harm reduction program is not illegal. So we're doing that work actively. And we invite people that are listening, if you wanna get involved in the advocacy to join us in the effort to pass the state legislation. But at the end of the day, we need to open these programs in order to save lives. We have a legal framework to do that with the bill that's been passed. Part of this process is also engaging local law enforcement, the state attorney general's office, the district attorneys, and the federal DOJ, as they're all learning as well how to look at this issue with a different lens. So that's an active process. And let me just say this in closing. This is an iterative process. This is not something that has been happening in this country until New York in December, but we have 30 plus years of experience from around the world that shows why we should be doing this, that shows the value of saving lives, the, the success of these programs. And now it's our job as communities to say, we don't want people to die. So lawyers, politicians, figure it out. Don't be the barrier, be the resource to actually save lives. And that's the work that we need to do as a community. Excellent. Thank you, Carl. Um, so there's two more topics that I want to make sure we cover and people to stick around for a couple more minutes um, while we talk about the flow of a site with TJ and um, costs with Matt. Um, so TJ, um, we've gotten many questions about um, how long people would stay, um, what does the site look like? And we saw a little bit of that with Miriam, but I was wondering if you could um, describe to folks um, what, um, 
folks could imagine as um, the flow of an experience of walking through a site could be like. Um, I thank you. Um, so I had I had I was lucky enough to go travel to New York last week and um, walk through and have a guided tour of their overdose prevention site, which was it was amazing, and it was beyond the scope of what I thought like what we're even trying to do here. Um, so like obviously it's a bigger population but like what was really what struck me is like you walk up and you don't you it's it's not really noticeable outside there's like maybe a couple people smoking but you see that outside of restaurants and anywhere else anywhere you go and you go inside and it's like so people walk in they walk in you know they like they register like however like you know they answer the certain questions like that they have to ask but they go in and there's like you know this great room where it's just it's it's an open room with like a TV and like couches and stuff. And then you go into the actual SCS. Um, and like, there, there wasn't like a giant way, like, I, like people weren't waiting. There, it wasn't like super busy, but I might've not, I don't know how busy it gets. Like Sam could probably speak to that better. But like when I went into the actual um, center, like it, it wasn't like super crammed, but it was, it was very, everything was peaceful. It was peaceful. And it was like a, it was a community center. It really, like that's what, like that's what really needs to be like taken into account. People are always worried about like folks being outside congregating or using using drugs in public. And like this was a place where people could go and feel comfortable and feel safe, and they were like able to get in and do what they were going to do, um, you know, and then have a safe place. There was an acupuncture room, the meditation room, like there was an outside garden. Like it was a place where people could feel safe. And I think that is like, because number one, we've always talked about the fact that the number one thing that we want to open these sites for is because it saves lives. It saves lives every day. And what I felt there when I walked in, like I cried because I walked into this, this place I cried like three times going through this tour because like I, when I was unhoused, which I'm no longer unhoused, which is great, but like, like there was laundry. It smelled nice. It was clean, but like not, it didn't smell like a weird sterile hospital clean. It just smelled nice and it was peaceful and people were having a good time and they were safe and no one, no one was like in a dangerous position and everyone was like, and I'm just going to go back to it safe. And it was one of the most touching things I've ever seen, like to have been working on this project for so many years now and to walk into one. That was so wonderful. And like to know that like actually to, to actually expand my imagining imagination about what we can build was it was it was like almost, almost overwhelming, but it was inspiring. And it's something that needs to happen for people. But people don't deserve to be out in the streets hiding or dying or being punished. They deserve to be in a place where they feel safe. And that is how whatever recovery people want or don't want, that is how you can begin any road to a better life is to have a place to walk into that that was as safe as what I saw in New York City. And that's what I want to build here. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Um, I can truly say it's a beautiful community that Sam and his staff and um, the folks who use the space have built there. Um, uh, I there's one more question um, that uh, Stephen has brought up uh, and would like to speak to uh, that he's noticed in the chat. Um, that's just about um, legality and um, the perception uh, of helping people do something that was that is uh, deemed illegal. So I would just like to turn it over to Stephen to address that question. Yeah, I, I saw this question come up several times in the in the chat um, about, you know, why are we helping people do things that are illegal? And I just want to share a little bit about what the life of a paramedic is like, um, what the life of people in the hospital are like. We help people who are doing illegal things all the time. Um, that's our job. We are, this is a medical 
facility that's serving a medical purpose, just like a hospital or an ambulance. I've had to treat the injured OUI operator of a vehicle that killed a pedestrian. I had to treat somebody who had just abused his child and then got beat up by the police. I've had to treat people, I had to treat a guy who stabbed his wife um, and got hurt in the process. We help people who do illegal things regularly. It's the basis of our job as medical providers. And I think that if you're going to center this entire discussion around this idea that we can't help because things are illegal, you're assigning morality to something that doesn't need morality assigned to it. We are in the business of helping people and helping the people that we care about. And so I really think that that's just a question you should just strike from your mind. Um, because I can guarantee you that if you did something illegal, I would still come and help you because that's my job. So thanks. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you all for such thoughtful and heartfelt answers and for the incredible work that you do every day. Um, so there were many, many, many questions that we didn't get to, but again, I will be sending a hefty uh, and substantial follow-up email and we'll get to as many as we can. And I'll turn it back over to Carl. Thanks, Carrie. And Sam, is that your hand raised? Did you want to make a closing comment? Yes, I just want to say something very quickly. Listen, I've received, um, I receive and have received thousands of inquiries around from folks around the country. I will tell the folks of, of, of this community to acknowledge the, the people, the folks, the team who came out and visited us. My concern about many of the communities who have been reaching out is they want me just to send them a policy and procedure and they're going to open. They're not investing what the folks who are leading this for your community are investing. They made time. They came down and spent time with us. They wanted to see it for themselves. Um, that investment is important. So I just wanted to add that call and, and really thank you and everyone who came again because you, 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 you went out of your way. And as TJ said, you already had an idea of what it was going to look like, then walked in and was like, wait a minute, it's, it's very different. So I just want to say that and, and acknowledge that important visit. You guys took time out of your, your busy schedules to come in and, and learn firsthand and see it firsthand. And you had a bunch of questions yourself. So I also want to say that. Don't please, uh, folks on this call, don't assume that they came in just saying, hey, this is great. It's going to be great. You guys came with a ton of questions, and I'm glad we were able to answer them. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that because uh, not many people are making that extra effort to come in and see what it takes to actually operate and, and, and facilitate the process uh, we get to do every day. So I just wanted to add that. Sam, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists and presenters tonight. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, to Sam's point, this is for Somerville a process. This is not the end of the process either. And so I know we have a number of questions we didn't get to. We will follow up over email with answers to those. There are a number of overlapping questions we'll organize and group and um, get your responses out to you. Um, I've seen a lot of questions about how people can get involved or how they can be engaged more, whether they're supportive or opposed or curious, uh, neutral on that, but how to get involved. What I would say is share what you've learned tonight, talk to your neighbors. I think the only way this will happen successfully is if as a community there is active and open dialogue and people are learning about this and being open about their con questions, concerns, and aspirations for what this can be to save lives and to address community concerns. So I just want to invite you to engage with your neighbors and friends in the community. Carrie mentioned this, we will send out an email with a link to the video once it's online, responses to some more of the questions, some other additional resources that you can share with folks as well. Uh, lastly, what I would say is Somerville is uniquely positioned to have this conversation. I served in the state legislature from 2004 until 2014 for the 34th Middlesex, including parts of Somerville, now um, ably represented by the wonderful Honorable Representative Christine Barber. Um, in that time, there was not yet an opioid crisis. That wasn't a phrase we heard yet. There was not yet a so-called overdose crisis. But Somerville was, Somerville was one of the very first communities that began to see high school students, teenagers dying of overdoses. And Somerville began to respond to say, we need to do something about it. 
We've seen how this epidemic has ravaged the entire country. I think Somerville is well positioned. It's an active community. You all know this, you're all active yourselves with your, your feedback and questions and concerns. This is a place that we can have this conversation respectfully, learn from one another, teach one another, and figure out how to do this well and do it right and set a model for the country. So I just wanna thank you as a community for being a part of this and more to come. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening and we'll be in touch and follow up.